Hi, this is Richard Sudlock. Welcome back to the Green Ninja course on climate science. This is the first of several episodes that examine factors that affect climate and produce changes in climate. I've divided the major players in the climate system game into overarching variables, regional controls, and global factors. And I talked about things listed as overarching variables during uh, the discussion of Earth's atmosphere and energy balance back in episodes 7 and 8 of this series. This episode focuses on the factors that produce regional effects on climate. The factors may operate in many parts of the globe, but the impacts that they produce are smaller scale than those of the global factors that we'll talk about later. The controls we'll look at are listed here. As you can see, the list includes fundamental processes or concepts, many of which you're already probably pretty familiar with. We start with axial tilt. You probably know that Earth's axis of rotation is not at a right angle to the plane in which Earth orbits around the Sun. Instead, it makes an angle of about 23 and a half degrees to that plane, although this number varies over thousands of years, as we'll talk about in episode 12. Because the Earth's surface is curved, different parts of it receive different amounts of insulation, that's incoming solar radiation, depending on the angle of the incoming insulation. This idea is depicted schematically in the top right diagram, and a bit more analytically in the diagram at the bottom, where 342 watts per meter squared of solar radiation enters the Earth's system, but the full 342 will be felt at the Earth's surface only where the sun is directly overhead. In other words, if the trajectory of the radiation is at a right angle to the Earth's surface. Okay, so this is the case with the um, vertical sunbeam <laughs> at the left in that bottom diagram. The 342 watts per meter squared strikes a one meter square surface. But at the right, the lower sun angle of 45 degrees means that the 342 watts per meter squared is distributed over a larger area, 1.41 square meters, in fact. Well, now you have the 342 watts per meter squared that has to fill a bigger area. So to determine the insulation affecting one square meter, you have to divide 3 point, uh, 342 by 1.41, and that's only 242 watts per meter squared. Here's another depiction of this relationship. The bottom diagram shows a, a sunbeam arriving at the equator. The middle diagram shows one at latitude 30 degrees north. The top diagram shows one at latitude 60 degrees north. All the sunbeams have the same width as they approach the Earth, but at higher latitudes, they're spread out over larger surface areas. The larger the surface area, the less the insulation is at any particular point. You can demonstrate this in a dark, darkened room with a globe and a narrow beam of light, say from a laser pointer or a flashlight. We experience the seasons of winter, spring, summer, and fall because of the different amounts of insulation received at different parts of the Earth, and because the Earth's rotation axis is tilted. This cartoon shows Earth at four stops in its nearly perfectly circular orbit around the Sun. The axis points in the same celestial direction all year. It's roughly aimed at the North Star in the Northern Hemisphere. But different parts of the Earth will get different sun angles at different times of the year. At the extreme, the North Pole gets no insulation in December and 24 hours of insulation in June. This simple cartoon reminds you of what you know from living your life. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, December features shorter days and lower sun angles than does June. The months are reversed in the Southern Hemisphere. The next control on climate, latitude, is very straightforward. More insulation enters the Earth's system near the tropics than near the poles for reasons involving the axial tilt and the seasons that we just discussed. As this diagram of annual annual surface temperature shows, the low latitudes near the equator are warmer than the high latitudes in the polar regions. But let's take that a step further. This diagram with 
north at the top and south at the bottom, shows the annual insulation of the planet in the red line and Earth's own outgoing infrared radiation in blue. Both quantities are higher to the right. Well, the tropics have a net energy surplus. They take in more energy from the sun than is radiated out from the Earth in those latitudes. But the reverse is true at higher latitudes where an energy deficit is run. Cumulatively, uh, cumulatively though, it, it all adds up to zero. The orange area equals the sum of the two blue areas. The ideas illustrated by this diagram raise a couple of key questions. Why don't the poles which are running an energy deficit, keep getting progressively colder? And why don't the tropics, which are running a surplus, keep getting progressively hotter? Think about this for a bit. Well, solar radiation is redistributed by pressure differences in the atmosphere, which carry warmer air to higher latitudes and cooler air to the tropical ones. The net transfer of energy from low latitudes to high latitudes prevents runaway temperature extremes. Such pressure systems, in fact, constitute the next of our regional climate controls. To appreciate the control exerted by pressure systems, we need to review some basic weather rules. First, rising air cools. Second, cooler air produces more precipitation. Higher atmospheric pressure forces air to sink, and lower atmospheric pressure allows air to rise. All right, the blue and the red text in these statements are color-coded to this diagram, which shows a rough cross-section of the atmosphere in the northern hemisphere. The equator is to the right, and the North Pole is to the left. High and low pressure, labeled at the bottom of the diagram, cause air to move vertically and horizontally in a set of convection cells, whose names are totally unimportant for our purposes. Wherever air rises, clouds form, accompanied by precipitation. That's rule number two from above. Particularly wet and stormy is the equatorial area, with its intertropical convergence zone, or ITCZ, where air masses from the north and the south meet. They rise as a result of low pressure and produce clouds, storms, cyclones, and hurricanes. Here's another look at those convecting air masses. It's idealized, and certainly the circulation in the world isn't as perfect as shown here, but I want to draw your attention to the regions near 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, where high pressures dominate. These highs, these pressure highs, force air downward, and a lot of that air moves towards the equator. The resulting air masses meet and are forced upwards, so we have sinking dry air at the 30 degree regions and rising cooling moist air near the equator. Okay, so at the equator we know it produces the ITCZ with lots of clouds and precipitation. But what, look, at, look at the bands along 30 degrees north and south. Those are deserts. Lots of them. And all of the planet's major deserts. They're all in bands in each hemisphere between about 20 degrees and 40 degrees latitude. And we just saw why. It has to do with pressure and moving air. Our fourth regional control on climate is altitude. And this is a very straightforward idea. Higher altitudes are generally cooler than lower ones. If you live in an area with varied elevations, you know this from experience. In the southern San Francisco Bay Area, when it's snowing on Mount Hamilton, which has an elevation of over 4,000 feet, it's raining in downtown San Jose, which is near sea level. This is because the temperature in the troposphere drops about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1,000 feet of elevation gain. This photograph shows the day after a winter storm. There's snow on Mount Hamilton dead ahead, but no snow anywhere near San Jose proper. Our fifth regional control is the effect of mountains. Mountains deflect, or divert, moving masses of air. Generally, the windward side of a mountain chain, windward means the side from which the wind is blowing, is cooler and wetter than the leeward side. This cross-section of central California shows how the clouds pile up on the windward or west sides of various mountain ranges. 
The precipitation is greater there, and the vegetation reflects this. In contrast, the leeward, protected side of the mountains is drier, warmer, and home to scrawnier vegetation. This is particularly true in the rain shadow of the Sierra Nevada. So much moisture is squeezed out of the air that has to rise to move eastward that desert conditions are found on the east side of the Sierra Nevada. Our final regional control is the proximity of an area to large bodies of water. Land and water have very different heat capacities, which result in very different patterns of heating and cooling. These patterns are nicely illustrated by a classic lab experiment that's been performed roughly 4.38 zillion times by students around the globe. This slide shows the setup and the steps. Similar volumes of soil and water are placed the same distance from a heat generating bulb. Turn on the bulb, record the temperature at regular intervals, typically every minute. After a while, turn it off and keep recording the temperature at regular intervals for a while. The typical average results of the experiments are shown here. The temperatures of the soil and the water both rise when the lamp is turned on, but the soil heats much faster than the water. When the lamp is turned off, the soil cools much faster than the water. These differences stem from the different heat capacities of those materials. This chart shows the average monthly temperature in degrees C for two U.S. cities at latitude 37 degrees north. Which of the two cities, A and B, is near the coastline of a large body of water. So pause me, don't continue until you have figured this out. Okay, you ready? Yes, the correct answer is A. In the course of the year, its average temperature varies little, just like the water in the heat lamp experiment. City B is in the continental interior, where much more extreme temperatures occur in both summer and winter. These maps show average daily high temperatures within the U.S. In July, at the left, high temperatures in the Great Plains and the Great Lakes states are similar to those in California. But in January, at the right, high temperatures are much lower than in California. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I know this from experience. And that's the end of this episode.